house, Lord, and learn from your word, Lord. Just ask that you be with Brother Nick as he gives us the lesson. Let every word that comes out of his mouth be from you, Lord, and that touch each and every body here and online. I ask one in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Kathy and I were having a uh, good evening and welcome. Kathy and I were having a discussion earlier this evening, and uh, Kathy has been laid up, as you know. She's had the opportunity to watch a number of different shows. To put it mildly. Um, anyway, she was. Uh, what show were you watching? Forensic you Files. Forensic the tree, Files? The tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was watching one of the forensic but the, the problem I have with her watching forensic files is she takes notes. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't good. No, that ain't good. But one of the things she found out was uh, in this particular episode, the guy pointed out that they were interviewing that each tree has its own individual DNA. I remember that one. Think about that. Just think about that. And as a matter of fact, we were watching another one that had to do with a pond. And they were talking about the uh, one cell creatures that lived in the pond. You remember this one? They're called diatoms. And they're one cell creatures, but these particular diatoms were unique to that pond occurred nowhere else. I just found that fascinating and interesting. All right, we're talking about establishing intimacy with Jesus. And we start talk this week we want to talk about how do we start becoming a seeker of Jesus. Now the seminary, this, the motto of the seminary anymore is to turn Jesus seekers into Jesus influencers. So, intimacy with Jesus is extremely important. It's that day-to-day -day intimate walk with Jesus, that daily intimate walk, is what defines us. And if you think about it, if we're going to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that has to be exercised, and it has to be practiced. Because we're not used to living like this. You know, Jesus says, um, uh, I'm sorry, Paul said, uh, I'm getting mixed up. Let me just move on because I, I can't remember the passage. <clears throat> Jesus, I'm sorry. In Galatians, Paul tells us, keep in step with the Spirit. Okay? And also, 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, train yourself to be godly. <clears throat> so we've got to be about that business of learning how to think in a new way. And how do we do that? Now, I just want to cover again what we, uh, what we covered last week. We're slaves to righteousness. God owns us. And I've given you the passage right here. We become slaves of God. We were bought at a price. We're Christ's slaves. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. But as slaves of Christ doing the will of God, live as God's slaves. God owns us. You were purchased and bought at the cross. And then we gravitate to adoption and sonship. And then it, there's, this, there's this quantum jump, which we're so thankful for, so you are no longer a slave, I'm under adoption and sonship now, but you're God's child. We're an heir to the kingdom. And this is the way we've got to start thinking. If we're going to have peace, this is the way we're going to have to start thinking. We're going to have to start thinking as a member of God's family. And it says, not only or God has made us, since you are his child, God has made you an heir. And in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. And we eagerly await 
or for our adoption to sonship, and sonship means the redemption of our bodies. So we see the whole sequence here. We've gone from slaves to being adopted to being heirs of the kingdom, being children of God. But how do we learn to live like this? How do we learn to absorb this intimacy with God? Because let's face it, we're sinners who are lost out in sin. We've changed positionally with Christ. We're saved because we believed. <laughs> but we have to learn how to do this. And this is, I think, a part where a lot of people get stuck because a lot of us aren't really sure exactly how to proceed. We talk about reading the Bible, we talk about praying, and by and large, that's where a lot of us stop. But it's much more than that. And we're going to start delving into that. And hopefully you're going to find this next few weeks really transforming you into the godly creature that I think we all really want to be if we truly understood. So it says, Romans 12, 2 said, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And again, 1 Timothy 4, 7, Train yourself to be godly. So you can open up to the next page. And the way you do this, you got to start thinking in terms of spiritual practices. Now, a lot of people don't like the term practices. Nobody likes to practice. Let's face it. Practice is boring. But it's necessary. If you're going to be good at something, you got to practice it. Practice makes perfect. Indeed. My daughter called me up the other day. She said, do you think I can learn to play the piano? I said, absolutely. What does she have to do? Practice. Practice. <clears throat> I prefer to call it, and I look at this in a little bit different way. Galatians says, keep in step with the Spirit who, who, reveals all, who reveals truth to us. I like to call it communing with Christ. We get the opportunity, much like Moses did in the Old Testament, to sit down and talk to Jesus. We get that opportunity. Now, the other thing with other religions, other forms of worship and all that, they're talking about somebody who's dead and still in the grave. We, however, worship somebody who is very much alive, very much loves us, and very much cares for us. But he wants us to learn how to commune with him. So I'm going to be using the word practices mainly because this is a website I got it from, which you're going to see in a second. It's right there, spiritualpractice.ca. It's a pretty good website. Let me, let me touch on that for a minute. Spiritualpractice.ca has got a lot of really, really good stuff in there about how you go about this. But you've got to be careful. I've taken out some stuff because there's some new age stuff that's in there. So if you go out and look at it, which I encourage that you do, just be careful what you're reading. Because there's going to be new age stuff out there. And there's a chance that you can misinterpret some, some stuff. Now I was reading a book several years ago, written by a guy by the name of Brian McLaren. And he's got a friend of his who's a Buddhist. And this friend of his said, the problem with you Christians is that you see Jesus as a belief. Buddhists see Buddha as a way of life. And that's one of the, that's one of the places we've got to start changing our thinking. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So we need to start absorbing the idea that Jesus is a way of living. He is the way of living. But we're insistent for various reasons that we're going to get into, not tonight. For various reasons why we're so insistent on following our own path. Instead of walking the path that God has in store for you. Which I would guarantee you is a whole lot better. Because you'll be have a whole lot more peace. 
But much of this comes from this website I'm referring to here that we're going to talk about tonight. And we're going to talk about it in the next three, four weeks. A spiritual practice is any regular and intentional activity that establishes, develops, and nourishes a personal relationship with the divine in which we allow ourselves to be transformed, to be changed from the inside out. One thing Jesus will do for you, he will change your thinking over time. And all you have to do is pursue him. All you have to do is pursue him. If you really want to grow spiritually, then spiritual practices, spiritual communion, is an absolute necessity. It's essential. You can't just, now, I'm kind of speaking of a choir here, because it's Wednesday night. But I know people who go visit Jesus once a week on Sunday. And then they expect to get something out of that. I got a couple of friends who are like that. And nothing's happening in their life. And then they, they can't understand why. Um, it's a sad fact. How many of you remember the title of this past Sunday's sermon? What was it, Peter? There you go, Dave, at least one remember. <laughs> but you get the idea. Most of us can't even remember the title of the sermon or what the subject of the sermon was. Yet we probably walked out of here and walked out of the, out of the church on Sunday and said, boy, that was great, which it was. But how many of us really remember Little hint, if you really want to get into that kind of thing, take the sermon, make a few notes, and let that be your Bible study for the week. That's one real good way of really absorbing it. I'm helping you out here. Thank you. One of the things we notice about spiritual communion practices is it's regular. A practice communion is something that is built into one's life. It becomes as regular as brushing your teeth, taking the dog for a walk. Developing such a regular habit takes perseverance, determination, and good humor. Experiment with something that you think you're comfortable with. Because we're going to talk about a lot of ways we can commune with Jesus. And none of them by themselves are overwhelming. They're inconvenient. When there's a good reason for that. But as we go through these next few weeks, we're going to see various ways that we can commune with Jesus Christ. It's intentional. To commune with Jesus, a practice is something that you should deliberately build into your life. You have to be intentional about it. You've learned that being a Christian is more than about how to live your life than to live than what you believe. Again, Jesus is the way. He is the way of life. And we, you, we're not used to thinking like this. It establishes and nourishes a personal relationship with the divine. It's not about developing greater peace, although that's a definitely a, ben a huge benefit. You will start to get peace. Spiritual practice is when you intentionally and regularly engage because one wishes to deepen a relationship with Jesus. And he'll let you go as deep as you want to go. He'll let you go as deep as you want to go. But you don't necessarily have to do that. All that matters is you walk with him on a daily basis. And he already knows everything about you to begin with. And he hasn't thrown you away. So therefore, just make a decision that you're going to do this. And the way that you're going to do it is going to be actually be a whole lot easier than you really think it is. The key word here is relationship. A relationship with God grows through frequent contact. Dave goes and visits his dad and his uncle quite often. He maintains a relationship that way. 
Okay? You know? I say hi to Kathy once a week and then we don't talk to each other. <laughs> and we live together. Now, that's obviously not true. But think about that. That's an oft used example. You didn't just go to, you didn't just walk down the aisle and say, hey, this was great. Let's do this again next week. It doesn't quite work like that. Going over to the next page, one engages in spiritual practices, communion with Jesus, in order to be transformed. Actually, not just changed, but to be transformed from the inside out. Totally changed. Now, there's a wide variety, a wide range of spiritual practices. Like I say, we're going to be going over a number of these things. And there's some you're going to say, I can do that. And there's some you're going to say, I don't think I can do that. And that's fine. The idea is to look at the things we're going to be talking about, the ways of communing with Jesus, and there's, no, there's a number of them. And you're going to decide, you're going to say, I can, I, you know what, I think I can do that one. And then you might add another at some point, or maybe another at that sort of point. And that's fine. In the Christian tradition, a spiritual practice, communing with Jesus, must intentionally focus on our relationship with the divine Jesus Christ. The bottom line being a Christian is engaged in the task of becoming Christ. We need to live our lives as Jesus lived his. Now, no one's expecting you to go to Galilee and start performing miracles. No one's expecting you to walk outside the store and start performing miracles. But Jesus lived a life that exemplifies what it means for us, but it will change with each and every one of us, depending on what our circumstances are. Um, spiritual training, which gets to the heart of it. Well, spiritual practices, communing with Jesus, are ways to open ourselves to God's presence, to make ourselves available to God. And then I talk a little bit about spiritual training. An athlete doesn't all just all of a sudden say, I'm going to run a marathon today. they got to work up to it. And that's the way we are. So don't expect that you're going to dive into some of the things that we're going to be talking about, and it's just automatically going to happen. It takes time. It takes time and commitment. But the rewards are far worth it. Let's go to the last page. What, sp what spiritual practice is for me? Not all spiritual practices suit everyone. There are personality differences which affects how comfortable we are with certain forms of communing with Jesus. Whatever practices you end up adopting, it should have as its prime aim that you are made available to God. They're not about you. They're designed to... You're not designed to improve your sleeping, relax, you give you peace, although that's going to be a side benefit. They are designed to open you to God. To let God enter your life and to help you open to God's presence. Now, spiritual traditions. I want to take a minute on this. Spiritual traditions basically means the way you are oriented towards the faith. Because different people approach the faith from different perspectives, different contexts, and you're going to see that. <coughs> Some of you might prefer the contemplative tradition. You just want to be intimate with God. Jesus spent a lot of his time praying in solitude. That might be attractive to you. It may not. Okay? It's designed to just say, you know what? I just want to draw close to God. That's what I really want to do. And that's one valid way to go about this. It gives you an overall framework of how you're going to proceed. For some of us, <clears throat> living an inner life with God that transforms the heart and builds deeply ingrained habits of virtue, the holiness tradition, learning how to leave, 
lead a virtuous life. That might turn your crank for some of you. Say, you know what, that's, that sounds like a pretty good idea. I want I talked to one guy one time, this is when we were still living in Delaware. His name was Robert. And he said, what meant a lot to him was, he said, you know, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Bible, I believe all this. He said, but I often wonder if I'm wrong. He said, but the bottom line is, even if I'm wrong, I just want to live the most quality life I could possibly live. And that was a big deal, Robert. That was a big deal. So you might decide that learning how to lead a virtuous life, filled with virtue, you know, that might be the thing that's for you. Living the spirit-empowered life, the heart of this tradition, lies in the belief that we do not live our lives under our own steam. We are created to live out our lives in cooperation with the Spirit of God. In other words, what might be really meaningful for you is, I'm just going to be in tune with the Spirit, like Galatians says. I'm just going to walk each and every day and see, commune with the Spirit, see what the Spirit wants me to do. And that's, that's perfectly valid. The social justice tradition, living the compassionate life, this focuses on justice and shalom, peace, in all human relationships and social structures. It's a very compassionate way of living. And this might be very meaningful for you. Okay, What Dawn is doing and what Debbie are doing with the uh, Redemption Center is an example of this. Uh, and Leila. What's that? Another one is the evangelical difference. You want to see people come to Christ. This is a big deal to you. You want to live in such a way that you influence people in such a way that people are going to be attracted to come to Christ because of you. Approaching the faith in this way, approaching Jesus in this way, may be a big deal to you, and that's fine. Perfectly valid. And then the incarnational, the sacramental life. This tradition focuses on how the spirit works in and through everyday life. It focuses on making present and visible the realm of the invisible spirit and finding God in the details and serving God through these details. This is kind of a discernment kind of thing. Whereby you want to see how God is working how the Spirit is leading people. You know, and this is this is where you probably have the gift of discernment. But all these ways, these will give you a basic context of how to start communing with God. How to start to get to know Jesus better. And it'll start getting you down the path of saying, you know what? I can turn my life, I can turn my life 100% over to Jesus. And that that, folks, is really the object. Thank you.